D. Paul Beck here with HarpazzoTV.com, and we've finally arrived at Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, one of the most difficult prophetic passages in all of God's Word, and these four verses provide this student of Scripture the only timetable provided within the Old Testament for the Messiah's first coming. Within these four verses, we will see that Daniel is now about to receive extra revelation. This revelation provided is verbal. It's a form of revelation where God is physically speaking his will into history. Now, I want to emphasize that this revelation does not happen at all times, during all epochs or ages. And thus, we have to be careful in today's world as we study the Bible and we live the Christian life that has been given to us. Revelation is verbal, and God's revelation has been captured for us within the 66 books that we refer to as the Bible. God indeed speaks words into history. Those he wants us to know have been captured for us within Scripture. And within the book of Daniel, we find this revelation being provided via a military analogy through the use of the angelic realm. As we reviewed within our last video teaching, God does not go directly to Daniel as he would if Daniel were a typical prophet. And the reason that he doesn't is because Daniel is a statesman inside the kingdom of man. And because Daniel is inside the kingdom of man as a statesman, he is not functioning directly as a prophet. He doesn't fit the mold of a typical prophet. And we know that because we see within the book of Daniel that there is no direct communication from God to Daniel. The revelation provided to Daniel is indirect. It comes via an angel, but the concept is the same. So the first principle to revelation that I want to stress is that revelation can be provided through either direct or indirect means. God issues the order and God transmits it in this chapter through the angel Gabriel. This is a verbal order and it is not intended to be misunderstood. No one ever gives an order or speaks or writes without expecting someone to understand it. A second principle to Revelation is that it is personal. That means that we are not neutral within this situation. After God has said, I love you, which he has said to you, you are free to either accept that fact or to reject that fact. But the point is that you cannot remain neutral. There is no neutrality within this position. The personal quality that comes with revelation forces a person off the fence. We hear the word of God, and we bow the knee or we don't bow the knee, one or the other. And thus, there is no neutrality within this subject area. So the second principle to revelation is that it is personal, and it forces you into a decision. The third characteristic to revelation is that it is historical. That means that God does not speak at all times and all places to all men. He speaks in some places, at some times, to some men. God speaks selectively within history, and he hasn't spoken a word into his creation since roughly 100 AD. We live in an era of the silence of God, just as there was a silence of God between roughly 450 BC and the time of John the Baptist. Some 400 years there was a silence of God. Now, in our day and age, there are people who are impatient with the silence of God, and they want to create on the basis of their own imagination, and also from demonic influences, a certain private ecstatic experience that stands in the place of true biblical Christianity, and it deceives an individual into a false sense that they have a relationship with the God of the Bible. God the Holy Spirit is not giving a new revelation, and he won't until the prophets come on the scene just prior to Jesus' return. So the point is that the third characteristic to revelation is that it is historical. Revelation is also comprehensive. That means that wherever God speaks, he's correct, and he's speaking to all necessary areas to life. If you were to step back and reflect upon it, you'd have to admit that within certain times within your Christian walk, you've crossed paths with a command or two in Scripture that you honestly didn't really know why it's there. Trust and faith dictated to us that in that situation, at that point within our maturity, we just needed to abide by his word and we needed to keep his commandments. We just had to do it, and through that, you were trusting in God's character and the fact that he does indeed know what is best for you. 
The revelation that has been provided to us is comprehensive, and there is no need to be seeking out additional revelation. The fifth characteristic to revelation is that it is prophetic. Prophetic meaning that it is beyond man's knowledge. Revelation gives us information that would otherwise be inaccessible to our minds. Revelation lets us in on what God is thinking, what his will is, and what his plans are for history. So the angel Gabriel, within Daniel 9, verse 21, appears to Daniel, and we read, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Remember that Daniel is using temple time here. Verse 22 and 23. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. And allow me to interrupt verse 23 here by offering a reminder that when it says the commandment came forth, it was a picture of God as commander-in-chief issuing an order. The Hebrew words within this verse provide the idea of a command going forth. It's an idiom that was used of the Medo-Persian king when he issued an order. When the commandment went forth, God gave the order. So Gabriel said, when you started your prayer, God issued the order. The commandment went forth, and I came to show it to you. I, the angel Gabriel, have come to deliver the order, and he made it from wherever he was in the universe to where Daniel was roughly four minutes later. So Gabriel delivers the order, and he wants the order to be understood. Obviously, you can't obey something if you can't understand it. And thus, with verse 24, we have the first verse out of four verses that explain the order that was issued by God. This is the content of God's order. It's actually an order regarding history, how God is going to decree that history is going to play out. Now, God is doing several things here. One of the things he's doing is looking forward in time. This is the year 538 B.C., As time moves forward, the Jewish people are going to be subject to tremendous persecution. They are going to suffer tremendously. Yes, indeed, history has demonstrated physical suffering, but the majority of their suffering is going to be within their minds. Realize that most suffering is within the mind. So Daniel is going to be the means that God uses to provide the advanced revelation for the Jewish mental attitude under persecution. He is going to develop the concept of faith used in the long range. This long range faith is referred to within the Bible as hope. That's what the word hope means in the Bible. It doesn't mean, gee, I I hope this is going to happen. That's not it. That's a completely wrong idea. Hope within scripture means patient, enduring faith. Hope is a long enduring concept that history will one day be consummated in perfect justice that God's program will come to pass the way he has promised it. And if you understand that definition, then you'll recognize that hope and the subject of eschatology go hand in hand. A proper eschatology will lead you to a proper and enduring hope. An incorrect eschatology will lead you to an improper hope, and thus a disappointment that will crumble your foundation once that hope doesn't prove itself out. Underlying this whole concept of hope, since faith has to be in something, you have the character of God, and it is the character of God that is revealed within the book of Daniel. And the attribute to God's character that is most in view within the book of Daniel is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is highlighted within this book because God is shown to be the unseen actor behind all major historical events. So Daniel is going to be the mechanism that God uses to provide the Jew with this enduring hope, a hope that goes on to this day. Daniel was one of the source points for this enduring hope, and what we read in verses 24 through 27 are a tremendous factor within enduring hope. So let's get ourselves oriented properly, and let's take a look at all four of these amazing verses. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, 
and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know therefore, and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. One of the points I have stressed throughout this Daniel series is how the book of Daniel is intended for a mature believer. The book of Daniel is not intended for a light, casual reading by a babe in Christ. The book of Daniel can truly only be understood by a mature believer, and one of the ways in which we can demonstrate that is due to the fact that certain passages, like what we see here in verses 24 through 27, are written in what we can call code. These four verses are from an apocalyptic book, requiring the reader to be well studied in scripture. Therefore, it takes a great maturity to move throughout the book of Daniel, and without being well studied in scripture, the immature Christian reading through the book of Daniel will be met with interpretation problems that will only leave them confused and frustrated. The first interpretation problem that is encountered within these four verses is, what are the weeks that are mentioned? Are they symbolic? Are they literal? Are they days? Are they years? Just what are the 70 weeks that are referred to here? The second interpretation problem is, what calendar should we be using once we've figured out what the weeks are? Are we supposed to use a lunar calendar, a solar calendar, a Gregorian calendar? Is this a calendar with 365.25 days within it or 360 days within it? The point is, we've got a calendar problem that needs to be understood if we are to interpret these four verses correctly. What calendar system are we to use in order to correctly compute these weeks? The third interpretive problem that we encounter is, what is the beginning point of the 70 weeks that are specified within these verses? When do these weeks begin within history? What we see here is that it says it shall begin at the commandment of the going forth to build the city. Well, when was that? So we've got to ascertain when these 70 weeks begin. The fourth interpretation problem that we come upon is that these 70 weeks are divided into three periods, seven weeks, 62 weeks, one week. Well, what are those three periods of time? What do they mean? Are they present or are they past? Are any of them speaking to the future or has what we are reading here completely played out within history already? The fifth interpretation challenge is, when do the 70 years end? Again, is this past history or is this yet future? The sixth problem that we've got to solve is that there are two princes mentioned within this passage, and thus, we need to figure out who each of these individuals are. There are two princes. Are they the same man? Are they both the Antichrist, or is one the Messiah and the other one the Antichrist? Are these verses indicating that they are both the Messiah? So the sixth interpretation challenge is just who are these two princes? The seventh problem we encounter comes to us by way of verse 26, where we see the phrase, the people of the prince that shall come. Is this verse speaking to the prince, or is it speaking to his people? If it is speaking to his people, just who are those people, and how should we be viewing this label? Our eighth interpretive challenge is found within verse 27, and it causes us to ask the question, what are the desolations that are mentioned within these verses? That's the eighth and final interpretation problem that we are going to address head-on within this video teaching. We have eight rather difficult interpretation problems that have to be solved in order to understand this passage of four verses correctly, and that is why I can confidently state that the book of Daniel is intended for a mature believer who is well studied in scripture. 
A babe in Christ cannot extract from this book the true revelation that is intended to be conveyed here within these verses. So let's begin our dissection of these four verses with an analysis of this term we see in the English, 70 weeks. The lexicon tells us that the Hebrew looks like this, Shavim, Shavuah. Shavim is a numeral translated as 70. That's straightforward. And the Hebrew, Shavuah, represents a period of seven, either days or years. So this term Shavuah is heptatic, and the heptatic structure to the Bible is a fascinating study that we will have to reserve for a future video teaching. But the emphasis here is that this term Shavuah speaks to either seven days, a week, or it speaks to seven years. Obviously, these two Hebrew terms look very much the same, and that's because they come from the same basic root. It's the stem for seven. So it's imperative that we lock this subject down and for us to be firm on just what these weeks are. Are they days or are they years? Well, if we do a concordance study and we look at this word Shavuah, we find that it is used in a multitude of ways. It's not used to specify just one unit of time during all usages of this term within Scripture. It speaks to, for example, days within Leviticus 12, verse 5. It speaks to years within Genesis 29, verses 27 and 28. So what we need to acknowledge at this point is that we have a precedent here, that Shavuah does speak to years in certain places within Scripture. But I think you'd agree that we'd all feel a little more comfortable within this discussion. I mean, after all, these four verses are paramount to the foundation of biblical eschatology. So we rightfully desire something more than just precedent. So looking further into this, if we go back within Daniel chapter 9 for context, keep in mind that another rule for Bible interpretation is to read the context where the interpretive problem occurs, and we're looking for a hint or a clue provided within the immediate context. So when we look at the context of Daniel chapter 9, we see in verse 2 the statement by Daniel, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So in the immediate context, what is being discussed here? Days or years? The context is years. Daniel 9 verse 2 is evidence from the immediate context that years are what is in Daniel's mind as he is speaking to this entire subject area. So the conclusion we are drawing here is that Shavuah is used of years within these verses in chapter 9. So with our first interpretive challenge, we are concluding that the 70 weeks mentioned within these four verses are referring to years, not days. That every time we see the word weeks within this context, we are to be thinking seven years. So let's do two things at this point. Let's run through these four verses again, but this time let's replace the word weeks with seven-year period, and let's do the necessary math along the way. Seventy-seven-year periods, 490 years, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven seven-year periods, forty-nine years, and threescore and two seven-year periods, four hundred and thirty-four years, threescore meaning sixty, plus the two, sixty-two times seven years, that equals four hundred and thirty-four years. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two seven-year periods, 434 years, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one seven-year period, and in the midst of the seven-year period, meaning at the three-and-a-half-year mark, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, 
and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So let's go back and take a high-level pass at what's in view here. Verse 24 provides us with the overall length of time to this prophecy, 490 years. With a careful reading of these four verses, the student of eschatology will learn that this 490-year period is broken down into further time periods. What we're reading within these four verses is that there are two high-level time periods defined for us, a 483-year time period and then an interval of some type, followed by a seven-year time period. Very simple math. We have a total of 490 years. As we move from verse 24 to verse 25, we see a further defining, or a breakdown, pertaining to the 483 years. Within verse 25, we first see a 49-year period specified, and that is followed by a 434-year period. Again, simple math. 49 plus the 434 provides us a total of 483 years. So there's the first piece to this puzzle. We see that the 483 years is defined in verse 25, and that it is broken down into two time periods for us, 49 years and then the 434 years. If we take the 483 years away from the original 490 years, we are left with seven years, and sure enough, We've seen that those seven years are detailed for us within verse 27. Before we get to verse 27, however, the Holy Spirit has information for us that he wants us to understand within verse 26. We'll be looking at this verse in detail in a moment since it provides us our seventh interpretive challenge within our list, a critical fork in the road when it comes to biblical eschatology. More on that in a moment, but jumping ahead to verse 27, we see the seven years specified for us here, and not only that, we also see that the seven years are broken down into two halves, three and a half years on either side of a pivotal event that occurs right in the middle of this seven-year period of time. So overall, what we see in these four verses, as it relates to the time periods that are mentioned, is the breakdown that you see on your screen. 49 years, followed by 434 years, followed by a seven-year period that is broken down into two halves, three and a half years each. We add all the pieces together, and we have 490 years. The difficulty comes in interpreting these four verses, understanding the events that are taking place surrounding each of these time periods specified, and correctly identifying a timeline for the events that are mentioned within this prophecy. So what we've done thus far is to address our first interpretive challenge. What are the weeks that are mentioned within these four verses? These weeks, a uh, Shavuah, are a measurement of time. In this context, they are seven-year periods, and these verses speak to 490 years that are broken down into certain major events, and thus further delineated by certain brackets of time. So if we step back from the details of what we just reviewed, we have to recognize that this prophecy, provided to Daniel by the angel Gabriel, has something to do with roughly five centuries of history. God is specifying here that for 490 years, he, God, is going to run his universe in this specific manner. God is defining 490 years of history here within these four verses, and that makes the 400 years of silence that I referred to within our last video teaching something that is not silent at all. God not only laid history out in advance within the end of Daniel chapter 9, but he also spoke to it within the remaining chapters of the book of Daniel, chapters 10 through 12. Now, why am I making such a big point over this? Well, for several reasons. Postmillennialists and amillennialists, those who we would call our brothers and sisters in Christ, who study the Bible and believe that Jesus Christ is not going to bring in a millennial kingdom, that he is not going to physically rule and reign on planet Earth for a literal 1,000 years, from his throne centered in Jerusalem, they have to use a different system of interpretation when looking at this prophecy. All millennialists and postmillennialists will agree with the premillennialist that we use the literal interpretation in the majority of places within Scripture. I mean, really, do they literally believe that God created everything in six literal days? Do they literally believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? 
Do they literally believe that the Apostle John received revelation while exiled to the island of Patmos? Yes, they do. They take those passages literally. If their answer is anything but yes to those questions, then that person providing the no answer is standing on shaky ground. They have a low view of scripture, and it's quite possible that their salvation may actually be in question. The point is that the amillennialist and the postmillennialist would have to show the premillennialist where it is within scripture where God states, here, right here, This is where I am changing everything I am revealing to you, from a literal sense to an allegorical sense. In all seriousness, when we read scripture, we read about a literal universal flood of Noah. We read literally that Abraham took Isaac to the top of a mountain. We read literally that Jesus performed miracles. And we read literally that John the Baptist was beheaded. Why then should we take prophecy and the passages that speak to eschatology as allegory? Where does the Bible instruct us to do that? And yet, that is precisely what the amillennialist and the postmillennialist does with Scripture. Why is that? Those of us who are premillennial argue that you must interpret prophecy the same way you interpret any other passage of Scripture, namely, a literal interpretation. And at the end of this debate, I am reminded of a quote that a dear brother to this ministry emailed into myself a number of weeks back. The quote comes from a Dr. David L. Cooper, and it states, When the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning unless the facts of the immediate context, studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths, indicate clearly otherwise. That is very well stated, and I could not agree more. Realize that the book of Daniel teaches a premillennialism position. That is, that history is headed toward a goal in which the perfect social order will be brought in by Jesus Christ catastrophically and miraculously with his return. So right here from the start of our list of interpretive challenges, we have a separation within interpretation as it pertains to those who make up the body of Christ. As you have obviously ascertained by now, I'm going to interpret this passage of four verses in literal terms. Speaking to literal years that have played and will play out in history. Well, the next question we want to ask of the text is, why 490 years? Why this odd way of telling Daniel 490 years? Up until this point, Daniel had 70 years on his mind. That's what he studied within Jeremiah's letter. Why is he being told 490 years now by the angel Gabriel? Why, to our 21st century minds, did the angel Gabriel speak in code and reference 70 weeks, seven weeks, three score and two weeks, in the midst of the week, and labels like that? Is there something that the angel Gabriel is trying to convey? There has to be a reason for it. Well, within Jeremiah 29 verse 10, a book we know that Daniel had been studying, He came to certain conclusions, and Daniel had done a simple subtraction problem, and he realized that in the year 605 BC, there had been the first wave of Jewish captives. So all Daniel had done was subtract 70 from that year, and he got 535 BC. Obviously, he didn't do it in our calendar system, but he basically got the same thing. And this was the date that was quickly approaching. So it was a study of verse 10 that originally led Daniel to his prayer petition. As we reviewed in detail within previous video teachings, Daniel read verse 10 and he recognized that Babylon was mentioned. He saw a clear and explicit statement that we're going to get a return from Babylon. He kept reading and he read verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. An expected end can be stated as a planned end. In other words, God isn't going to let Israel go. Daniel sees that. Daniel is starting to get clued in that Babylon is not the only thing here on God's mind. Daniel kept reading, and he saw in verse 12, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. 
Daniel had to be translating the use of the word then in verse 12 as a reference to when those 70 years are accomplished. Daniel kept reading, verse 13. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And to finish the point, verse 14. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. So what did Daniel learn in verse 14? God switched from speaking about Babylon to speaking about all nations. So what God stated here is that in 535 BC, I'll return you from Babylon. But then after the then, then I will return you from all nations. And we have to acknowledge that there is an ambiguous time element here within this verse. Daniel desperately tries to get verse 10 and verse 14 to come together at the same time within history. That's what his entire prayer was about. That's what Daniel wants. He wants the fulfillment of all five of those verses we just looked at. Jeremiah 29 verses 10 through 14. Not just the one verse, verse 10. He wants all five verses fulfilled at one time. So Daniel has on his mind here 70 years. What he desires is a period of 70 years and then the end of everything will come. That's what he's looking for and that's what he's prayed for. Now you may also recall that we have previously studied 2 Chronicles 36 verse 21. This passage explained for us why it was a 70-year period that was being specified within this whole discussion. So let's look at this verse again. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath, to fulfill threescore and ten years. So for the sake of time, let's summarize what we have previously studied. For 70 Sabbaths, the Israelite farmers had not let the land lay fallow. It was an ecological reason why God removed the nation from the land. They mistreated nature. They did not rule nature properly. And because of their faulty ecology and the lack of care for the natural resources, Israel was thrown out of the land. Most of you watching this video teaching are very familiar with the concept of a sabbatical year. Within ancient Israel, the farmer could plant his field for six years. But the seventh year, the land had to lay fallow under penalty of God's wrath. The reason the farmer in Israel could do this was because God would bless his crops in the fourth, fifth, and sixth year, so he'd have extra harvest that would carry over into the seventh. And the principle was that they were to stop the economy in the seventh year, and all debts were erased in the seventh year. Apparently, you had a total economic return back to zero, so to speak, every seventh year. This prevented inflation, it prevented long-term indebtedness. It was an economic system that was vastly different from the economic system that you and I live in today. The economic system that you and I live in today is basically satanic, but I digress. Back to Israel. The farmer was to trust in Jehovah's care. He was to trust in the fertility that was promised in God's word, that the first six years of that seven-year cycle would carry him through that seventh year. It was a way of resting, and it was a way of trusting in God Almighty. But the problem is that the farmers didn't do that. They didn't end up trusting God. They ended up planting all seven years within the cycle. God allowed the land to rest for both physical reasons, but also for theological reasons. For God, the solution to this was simple. God looked at the number of Sabbaths in which the farmers had ignored his instruction. That number happened to be 70 Sabbaths. 490 years they ignored God. For 70 sevens, the nation Israel was disobedient. For 490 years prior to Daniel and Jeremiah's day, the farmers had refused to obey the orders of the sabbatical rest of the farmland, and that provided the reason for and the background to the 70 years of captivity. So if we look back at Daniel chapter 9, we recall that the angel Gabriel stated, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. So he's saying, Daniel, not 70 years, but 70 sevens, meaning 70 times seven years, are yet determined. What Gabriel is saying is, Daniel, you know you were concerned about those 70 years. Let me tell you something. 70 times seven are yet to happen. 
So here's the point. 490 years before farmers had refused to plant correctly, to overplant, for 70 years there was the captivity. And Gabriel says there's going to be yet 490 years, 70 times 7, out into the future before history terminates for Israel. That's what is being specified here by the angel Gabriel when he says 70 weeks. So 70 weeks have been determined, passive voice, meaning that God has outlined history. God is sovereign. God is the planner of history. God shapes history. God's word shapes history. Seventy weeks have been determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Notice that there are always three things in view here within this passage. The city, the people, and the sanctuary. We're seeing here that we have 490 years being specified, and we have to ask the question, just who is it that is in view here? Who are these verses speaking to and speaking about? Is this speaking to the church of Jesus Christ? No. The church didn't even exist at this point in time. These verses are speaking to the nation of Israel. All 490 years are in reference here to the nation of Israel. These 490 years literally apply to Israel, and to be even more precise, they apply particularly to the city of Jerusalem. Things are going to happen in that city for an interval of 490 years that we must understand clearly. These verses are not talking to the church. Christians aren't even discussed within these verses. These verses are speaking to the nation of Israel. Now, verse 24 defines six purposes for this 490-year period. There are six reasons specified as to why we must have not 70, but seven times 70 years. First, to finish the transgression. Second, to make an end of sins. Third, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Notice that these first three reasons focus upon sin. And interestingly enough, when we study the words associated with these three on your screen, we find that they are the exact words that Daniel used during his prayer within verse 5 of Daniel 9. When Daniel made his confession, he confessed sin in all its natures. He said, we have sinned, the word for transgression. We have committed iniquity, and we have done wickedly. Those were three words. The first verb meant sin, missing the mark, cutting across God's standards. The second word emphasized the damage that was done, that sin always causes damage. And the third verb in Daniel 9, 5, have done wickedly, had to do with rebellion. In the King James, it's not translated that way, but that's the word to revolt, rebel. And it stresses a violation of God's authority by way of sin. Now, isn't it interesting that when Gabriel provides the answer to Daniel's prayer, seeing as how Daniel has said, Lord, we confess our sin. We did this. We did that. We're sorry. We confess. Gabriel then informs Daniel that not 70, but seven times 70 are ordained to finish out this aspect of that sin, to finish out the aspect of that sin, to finish out the aspect of this sin. So verse 24 is an exact answer to Daniel's prayer. Gabriel is saying sin will persist for Israel for 490 years in all of its aspects. It will not be finished until the 70 weeks are done. Now the next three reasons given in verse 24 have to do with God's righteousness. The same pattern is used as was in the beginning of Daniel's prayer. Remember Daniel's confession dealt with his own sin and it dealt with God's holiness. So in verse 24, Gabriel answers the prayer, first with a response to the sin problem, and then with a response to the facts pertaining to God's holiness. The pattern is repeated. So let's look at reasons 4, 5, and 6. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, meaning the holy place. Let's look at each of these three more deeply. To bring in everlasting righteousness, that means to bring about in real history, real space-time history, the ideal social and individual conditions where God's law will function in politics, in society, in the international arena. What's being said here is that God will bring in the righteousness of the ages. The righteousness of the ages is the goal of all the ages. The righteousness anticipated by all the ages. 
to seal up the vision and prophecy. Now be aware that the King James Version reads vision and prophecy. But as we look at the lexicon, we learn that the word translated here for prophecy is actually the word for prophet. So the way that we should actually read this portion of verse 24 is to seal up the vision and prophet. Now, if we accept that, then what does it mean? Well, this appears to indicate an end to prophecy during the millennial kingdom after Christ's second advent. What it appears to be saying is that once Jesus Christ brings about the ideal conditions of the millennial kingdom, perfect government with Christ ruling and reigning with a rod of iron in perfect justice, there won't need to be any prophets during that 1,000-year age. And we know that because Isaiah 11 verse 9 tells us, The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there won't be any prophecy in the sense of God speaking some words to some men in some places at some unique times. But all men, in all places, at all times, during the millennium, will have access directly to God's word. The conditions within the millennial kingdom will be so vastly different than what they are today, and thus the vision will be sealed and the need for prophets will not exist. Lastly, to anoint the most holy. Or we could read it as, to anoint the most holy place. And theologians speculate as to what this refers to. It appears to have something to do with the temple. But some speculate that it may refer to Christ. And still others speculate that it could somehow refer to the church. That the church might be in view here as an entity included within the overall temple of God. So this last item out of the list of six is a vague expression but it generally means to set up the final worship place of believers. Now, before we move on to verse 25, we need to take a look at our second interpretive challenge. Just what calendar should we be using in analyzing these four verses and applying the weeks of years to what is being revealed here? Well, within the 19th century, there was a man by the name of Sir Robert Anderson, an Englishman, a great student of the book of Daniel. Sir Robert Anderson is known in history for the discovery that the scriptures are not on a solar calendar. Anderson had an interest in astronomy, and he kept working with the calendar systems of the Bible over and over. He's written several books, most of which are out of print, but several are being reprinted. Sir Robert Anderson is going to become important later on within this video teaching, but for now, I want you to understand that his work in the 1800s assisted with answering our second interpretive challenge. If we look at Genesis 7, verse 11, we find proof that the scriptures do not work by our current calendar. This is also why so many dates in scripture don't seem to work out exactly, and it can't be that God isn't exact. We know our God is exact. So it must mean that there's a lack of precision within our calendar, not within the Bible. While looking at Genesis 7, we ask the question, what kind of calendar was being used during the time of the flood? Was it a solar calendar as we presently use, or was it another type of calendar? In verse 11, we read, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. So we have a certain piece of information. It says the second month of whatever the year system was, the 17th day of the month. So we can note those data points as 2 17, but don't look at that as February 17th. We're just noting it as the second month and the 17th day, using their calendar system from that period of time. Now, when we turn to the next chapter, Genesis 8, verses 3 through 4, we read in verse 3, And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the hundred and fifty days the waters were abated. Verse 4 tells us, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. So we see that these two verses state the seventh month and the seventeenth day. These verses also add supplementary information that 150 days transpired. So we take from this that there were five months of whatever the calendar system was that had transpired. 
So what does that tell you about the average length of the month? 30-day months. So that's one piece of data that we have that indicates that Scripture seems to be functioning on a 30-day month system. Next is Revelation 11. So we've looked at the first book of the Bible. Now we're looking at the last book of the Bible, an Old Testament reference and a New Testament reference. In Revelation 11, verses 2 through 3, we find ourselves in the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. These verses are speaking specifically about half of the tribulation period, and it says, But the court, which is outside the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the nations, and the holy city they shall tread under forty and two months. So the piece of information that we are interested in right now is this forty-two months that are specified. The forty-two months are twelve plus twelve plus twelve plus six. 42 months, three and a half years. That's one half of the tribulation, 42 months. Now we read in verse 3, during those 42 months, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Now it turns out that if you multiply 42 times 30, you end up with that number, 1,260. So here we have evidence again of 30 days per month being used in whatever the calendar system is that the Bible is using. So we have a proof from Genesis and a proof from Revelation that the biblical authors, whether they are John or whether they are Moses, they all appear to use a calendar system that is different from our calendar system. Sir Robert Anderson came to the conclusion that 30-day months, 12 30-day months, or 360 days, are what's in view within the Bible. This is going to become very important later within this video teaching when we look at interpretive challenge number four and we attempt to figure out when Daniel's 70 weeks began. What we'll need to keep in mind is that Daniel's time period, the century in which he lived, does not line up perfectly with the calculations and the calendaring that takes us to Christ's crucifixion. What we need to do within this exercise is to use the calendar system that Sir Robert Anderson discovered and documented within his great works. The calendar he documented matches up with the Mosaic Law, but the difference is that our calendar system is 365 and a quarter days, approximately, and it's 29 and a half days in a month. The Bible uses a calendar that is 360 days, with a 30-day month. Interestingly enough, and these are all extra-biblical references, so be cautious with them, but be aware that Babylonian astronomers recognized a year of 360 days. The Hindu Bhagavad Gita uses a 360-day year. All of the tribes of Greece, Rome, South America, Central America, and China used 360-day years. We see that in their writings. A circle has 360 degrees in it and all of our systems of trigonometry are based on 360 degrees. So the point with these last two bullets is that the calendar system that the Bible is using is the calendar that our modern mathematics is built upon. So with our third bullet item in this list, we have to ask ourselves the question, when did all these countries all across the face of the earth change their calendars? Well, the answer to that question and for the sake of time, I'll spare you the details, looks to be around the 7th to 6th century BC. History demonstrates that this is when a monumental calendaring change took place worldwide. 2 Kings 20 verses 10 through 11, the sign given to Ahaz, provides us a clue that dramatic events have indeed taken place that can easily influence the calendar as we know it. So, we have all kinds of evidence from all over the world that calendars were shifted. They were changed. Everybody was up in arms during the 7th and 6th centuries. The people complained that their calendars weren't working correctly. And it isn't until the 5th and the 4th centuries BC that the calendars finally get settled and solidified into what we know them to be today. So Daniel uses a 360-day year and a 30-day month. Daniel, as previously noted, insists upon using the old temple time. You'll recall that from verse 21. 
That temple time was kept in a 360-day year and a 30-day month. And we need to recognize that if God insists upon using a 360-day year, we can safely guess that he will return the planetary system back to that original calendar system. What I am saying is that it is plausible to assume that Earth will one day go back to a 360-day year with 30-day months. And the reason for that assumption is found in the fact that all these prophecies we are exploring are given to us in those terms. All of the prophecies pertaining to the end times and subjects such as the tribulation are also given in those terms. We know from scripture that the millennium operates under a revived temple and under its temple time, its temple chronology. And a careful reading of the book of Revelation indicates that the events of the tribulation period will be so catastrophic to the planet that the earth and the solar system will be altered once again within history. And thus, the calendar could indeed be moved back to the temple period, 360 day years. This shouldn't surprise us at all since we recognize that all of the physical laws are subservient to the word of God. God speaks it and it happens. When he spoke at creation, he brought into existence not just matter and energy, but physical laws at the same time. So our answer to interpretive challenge number two is a 360-day year with 30-day months. In order to answer interpretive challenge number three, the various time periods specified within these four verses, we have to dissect verse 25. The two words at the beginning of this verse, know and understand, look like this. They are two Hebrew words, yeda and sachel. The first word, yeda, translated in the King James as know, is the word to recognize by becoming personally involved with something. That means that Daniel is to take this prophecy and make it part of his soul. He is to put the divine viewpoint into the mentality of his soul. So when we think of Daniel's soul and think of his mind and how it works, Daniel is to take all this doctrine and file it in his mind so that in his mind he begins to develop the divine viewpoint, a framework that will control his understanding to history. Now why does God want Daniel, the statesman, to have in the mentality of his soul this kind of a catalog of history. Well, we know that Daniel is a leader of his people, and he is going to teach his people how to respond within history. Other people are going to read his writings, and he is going to become a teacher to the next generation. So, therefore, because Daniel is in this situation, Daniel has to have a divine viewpoint, not only for himself, but also for those who look to him for leadership. In other words, when you see that word no in verse 25, you truly are looking at God's warning to people in leadership positions to know doctrine. Believers, those who know God's word, make better leaders. Believers who apply the Bible's teachings and doctrine to their position of leadership, whether that is politics, corporations, or any organization, the best leaders come from those who know God's word. So the know, therefore, and understand means that the angel Gabriel is going to explain this, and he wants Daniel to get personally involved with what he has to instruct him so that it becomes part of him. When we read in verse 25, know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, realize that this initial part of verse 25 is pointing us towards our fourth interpretive challenge. We'll have to put that on hold for a moment as we explore an answer to this third interpretive challenge. Notice what is being spoken to within the rest of verse 25. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Remember that these four verses we're reviewing here speak to 490 years of history, history that is past, present, and future. The 490 years are divided into three sections. So what we need to do is to look at this from a higher level and to break this down into its component parts. Notice within verse 25, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, or seven sevens, 49 years. 
The next part of verse 25 states, and three score in two weeks, that's 62 weeks, 62 sevens, or 434 years. Verse 26 tells us, after three score in two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So we're tracking here that after the 62 weeks, something is coming. Verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, one seven, or one seven year period. So now when we step back and we look at the overall picture, we see the high-level structure to Daniel's 70 weeks. 490 years that are specific to Daniel's people, the Jews, the nation of Israel, not to the church. The church didn't even exist at the time that the angel Gabriel was giving all this revelation to Daniel. The church didn't come into existence until Pentecost and Acts chapter 2. So we have 490 years of history that God, through the angel Gabriel, revealed to Daniel. 483 of those 490 years are history past, and seven years of that history are yet to be fulfilled. That seven-year period is referred to within Scripture by various names. Within the context of what we are discussing here, the book of Daniel, it is known as Daniel's 70th week. Its most accurate label is the time of Jacob's trouble. That label comes from Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. And I can't stress strongly enough that it is the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, as you may recall, referenced in Genesis 32, verse 28, is a synonym for the nation Israel. So what's in view here, all 70 weeks that are discussed here, is something that is going to happen to the nation of Israel. Now, as believers living in the church age, we refer to this 70th week, this seven-year period, as the tribulation period. That label comes from Matthew 24, verse 29, and elsewhere. But the point is that there are multiple labels for this seven-year period, this 70th week that is being discussed within Daniel 9, verse 27. Now, history is divided this way, and if we understand it correctly, it ought to fit real history, what we've seen recorded over the course of history. Messiah is going to come to planet Earth. Messiah is going to be cut off. And then there's going to be something later on about a seven-year period. So we've got to place all this into perspective. And we've got to answer all these questions in order to gain the right perspective. We've looked at number three in our list, and we've dissected the high-level parts to this prophecy. That understanding helps us with number four in our list, the question of when did this whole thing start off? Keep in mind that we can't tell when this prophecy is going to end if we can't tell when it started. So our fourth major challenge of interpretation is the beginning of Daniel's 70 weeks. When did that occur? Well, in looking at verse 25, it tells us when. It says, from the going forth of the commandment. But the problem is that there were four commandments that we can find within Scripture that went forth. Therefore, we have to identify which of the four commandments is the right one. That identification will provide us the starting point to these 70 weeks we're looking at, and we'll take a close look at those four commandments at the start of part two of this video teaching on Daniel's 70 weeks. Please make sure you join us, and God bless.